Hi there, and welcome back to Water Child Tarot, or welcome if this is your first time. My name is Sarah, and as promised, I am going to do a um, sort of a tribute video to Lisa Pappas's This or That series. In this case, it's, it's going to be a This for These, um, because I have one deck that I just added to my collection that's going to take the place of several and I wanted to talk about why that is. Um, so I'll meet you down on the table in just a second and we'll take a closer look. So allow me to regale you with a little story um, or a little history of my deck collecting so far. So I've mentioned it before on the channel, but tarot came to me as an, a COVID coping activity. Um, it's really how I got reinterested and reinvigorated in it, in it and how I started collecting. Um, I started out with a Rider Waite Smith deck um, and then quickly moved on because I wanted something that was more modern, more representative of the people around me and the people in my life, and more relatable. And so at that point I bought a copy of the World Spirit Tarot um, and had that for a while. I did uh, trade that because I didn't love the cardstock and some of the images were a little weird. Um, and so the next one that I got um, in a fit of sort of, you know, thinking, oh, well, if it's if it doesn't represent any one kind of person, then it'll represent everyone. Um, and that's the Mesquite Tarot. I found some um, I'd found Tarot Tube by then, and I decided that this was going to um, fit the bill. And the reason um, is twofold. One is that it renames the majors in the same way that the world spirit does. Not exactly the same way, but they're not called kings, queens, um, knights, and pages. They're called novices, students, knowers, and leaders. And um, the people in the deck are represented like this. Oh, this deck is out of print, by the way. Uh, let's see. Zoom in a bit. Okay, so here's our... Here's our people. So there's sort of this silhouette kind of stick figure look. Um, some of them do have clothing on, but a lot of them are just silhouetted or represented in this way. And I liked a lot about this deck. I liked the color palette, um, the soft kind of colors. I liked the, the neutrality of it. For example, here we have the six of coins or six of pentacles. And you know, it's it's giving and receiving. Um, it's it's not necessarily in one direction, and you can't see the relative wealth or class of the people giving and receiving um, like you can in the traditional right of weight. Um, and so, you know, for that reason, I liked it. I liked the minimalism. Um, I liked the simplicity of it. I did like that there were some alternates to those um, troublesome cards like the Three of Swords. Here we have Three of Arrows. And so, yeah, um, you know, because the people don't really have any features, they can be gender neutral. Um, I like certain nods to nature, like the Wheel of Fortune card is um, the, the phases of the moon, for example. So there were so many things about this deck that I liked. Um, but what I realized, what I've come to realize, is that um, neutrality is not necessarily inclusive. Um, because instead of representing a cross-section of humanity and the, the rich variety of um, aspects and cultures and features um, and knowledge that we all have, uh, it represents sort of everyone and no one at the same time. And so I didn't actually end up using this deck as much as I thought I would. Um, one of the reasons too was that this was the first indie deck, out of print indie deck that I um, went in search of. It took me a while to find um, some back stock at a, um, a bookseller in London. And given the shipping cost and the fact that these were almost completely gone, um, you know, I, I paid um, more than I really wanted to for this deck, but I was, I was convinced that this was going to solve all my, you know, perfect tarot deck requirements. Um, so, so that was that. Um, you know, and it's a great deck um, for a lot of reasons, but it doesn't really, it's very, very simplified. And so it doesn't, um, 
it, it, it hasn't had a lot of longevity for me um, in my readings. Once I started to study more in depth, I quickly moved on from this. So um, at some point I came across the Melanated Classic Tarot by Ubria Tronshaw, who's the writer, and Julia Goolsby, um, who is the artist. Uh, and now this deck brought in, as the name implies, Melanated People. And it's very diverse um, because the folks in this deck could be um, different, you know, from di all different cultures around the world. Um, they are all melanated, so there's no white people, but white people only make up about 11% of the global population. So if you've got everyone else in here, um, then that's pretty diverse. And there aren't, I will say, there's not um, many faces in here that read as East Asian, at least to me, but um, certainly South Asian, certainly Arabian, Arabian Peninsula, that, that part of the world. Um, all over Africa, of course. But Sorry, I just wanted to zoom out. I realized I was too zoomed in. So um, even though there aren't really any East Asian folks in here, um, there are folks who, you know, could be from Africa, could be from all over the Caribbean, um, South and Central America, um, well, North America, of course. Um, so you know, in that sense, it's quite diverse. Um, but it is just a right away clone. So it doesn't bring, um, other than this important factor, it doesn't bring a lot of other um, newness, I guess, to tarot readings. And the other thing I came to decide about this after offering it in a number of instances um, to folks who had come to me for a tarot reading, both friends and people I didn't know, um, is that people were not choosing this deck. And I can't say exactly why, but I have a theory, which is, you know, I got this deck um, and put it in my collection so that folks um, who identified as melanated or who were are melanated would feel comfortable with me as a reader. Um, and that sounds very egotistical and, you know, may, maybe um, it wasn't intended that way, but I genuinely wanted to make sure people felt welcome and represented um, and that they could get a reading from me. But what I came to realize, and I felt silly that it, it took me a while to kind of come to this, um, is that folks who might want, it, for whom it might be important to have um, this much representation or this um, explicit of a representation in their tarot cards, probably also want to get a reading from somebody with some kind of relatable experience, life experience, cultural experience, etc. And that's not me. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged, middle-class white lady, and that's just, it, it just is what it is. Um, but I am not one of these people in the stack. And so why would you come to me for a tarot reading and expect me to offer this? I don't know. Um, so as much as I like this deck and I think the art is really good um, and I'm really glad that it's available, um, it is still available, I don't read with it. I don't get called to read with it. Nobody asks me about it when I offer it. Nobody takes me up on the offer. Um, and because it is a right away clone, it is kind of a one note deck for that for that reason for me. Um, now the author of the accompanying booklet, and actually she has a whole um, series of courses, Ubria Troncha, and I'll link their um, website below because she reads from an astrological perspective and a very Christian perspective. And I think that's something that is um, missing kind of in the tarot marketplace um, or the tarot uh, way of learning as a method of learning. And so I think um, she adds a lot of value to a fairly straightforward clone deck. So if those things interest you, I encourage you to check it out. And so this does have its place. Um, I think its place is just not with me. Um, and so I'm gonna be gifting this to somebody who is um, black or a person of, of color, and hopefully they can actually get some practical use out of it. So the next couple of decks I want to talk about um, are 
more about the palette used and the kind of art style. So the first one is going to be the Tarot de Marseille weight. And this deck is a Rider Waite clone, but all of the cards are in a more consistently medieval kind of Bayou Tapestry French medieval style. So I, I think the name's a misnomer. People say this is a um, Marseille deck. It really is not. Um, you will not learn to read Marseille with this. It has nothing to do with Marseille reading style. There are no pip cards except for the ones like this that are from the Rider Waite original imagery. What it does give you is this kind of um, consistent medieval style between the way that the pips are drawn and the way that the uh, face cards are drawn. And of course, it does have French titles, so it, it you know feels um, foreign or, or Marseille-ish, I guess you could say. Um, but really, it's just a redrawn RWS clone. Um, it's beautiful though. I love the colors. I really love this death card with the blacks with the uh, red sky behind it. Um, and yeah, I guess a couple of these are maybe redrawn in a in a Marseille-ish style. Um, come to think of it, um, but I don't think of it as a Marseille deck at all because to me they're not different enough. Um, AE Weight based his tarot on the Marseille and reconfigured it for his purposes, but really, you know, there's a lot of Marseille similarities even in the original RWS, um, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So this does not stray far from the Pamela Coleman Smith artwork in terms of composition, body style, uh, body posture, um, even the content here, you have the moon on her um, headdress there. And even things like the devil is, you know, it's based on the Marseille and the RWS, and then it comes back to the Marseille here. So um, I was really thinking this was more of a hybrid when, to me, it's just a medieval RWS, if that makes sense. Um, I do love the colors. I think the, the palette is really beautiful. It's, it's a lot, got a lot of earth tones, a lot of jewel tones, which is what I like. The blues especially, the, the blue skies and the blue backgrounds in this deck are very beautiful. And so if you don't like those bright, uh, harsh yellows and blues of the traditional RWS, this might be a nice alternative for you. Um, but I don't like the cardstock. It's very... I don't know, it's hard to explain. It's sort of laminated, it's got hard edges, um, it's semi-gloss, and it shuffles in a way that makes me think the cards are gonna crease or that I'm gonna accidentally bend one. Um, and so I just don't use it because it's not pleasant to handle. And I, you know, I do love the colors, um, but for, for a while now, it's, the color palette has been the only reason that I've held on to it, and I haven't actually been reading with it. So this one's out the door. Okay. Also talking about color palettes, we have the Vendor deck. Um, I'm going to show you a first edition version that um, I did a side by side between the first and second editions of this. Um, this entire deck is color coded, so you have the four colors here, blue, yellow, green, and red to represent the four suits. They're all presented in the um, trump cards. And then each of the minor cards has only one tone in it. So here are some of the majors. See, and they've renamed some of the majors, like the Hierophant is now Chiron. And it has this beautiful kind of minimalist style again. I was really drawn to minimalist decks. You saw that in the Mesquite Tarot. Um, you see that here. And then especially when we get into some of the minor arcana. It's a very pippish deck. There's not a lot of detail, not a lot of close-up faces. There's a few here and there, but a number of the figures are drawn at strange angles or for some distance. There's also quite a few cards that in the RWS do feature people, but here do not. And but the gestures and the sort of way that the items are drawn calls back to the RWS uh, imagery. Um, and I like, I, I do like this deck for all that, but
but um, it has that clinging kind of cardstock. It has rose petal cardstock. It doesn't have the stickiest rose petal cardstock that I've come across, but it's it's enough that it's a little bit of a pain to shuffle. Um, I do love this Knight of Swords. It's like the hastiest knight, and he's so it's in so much haste that he's just you can only see his foot. He's like almost out the door. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that I liked about this deck, and I did try using it for a bit. Um, this one doesn't read great for me. I don't know. I can't even put my finger on why that is. It might be all the white space, um, or just the lack of color. It's, it's, you know, it's so monochrome in the suit cards that it's almost like a black and white deck, and I don't typically go for those. Um, but there was just something about this, even though it's really beautiful, and I would love to maybe have, you know, a couple of these cards as, uh, posters or something. I also love this Wheel of Fortune. Um, I'd love to have this as art on my wall or like a screensaver on my phone or something like that. But I just, for whatever reason, I have a hard time. I kind of draw a blank when I put these cards out. Um, and between the, you know, between the rose petal finish and then the kind of, um, after a while bland color palette, to be frank, um, this one just wasn't doing it for me. Now, one deck that was doing it for me and that I've loved since I first, you know, saw it on the internet and then got hold of a copy is the Star Seeker Tarot. I've made multiple videos about this deck. I've gushed about this deck. Um, there's so much I love about it. I like the color palette again. Um, I like the fact that it is diverse in a number of ways, age diversity, body diversity, um, although not as much as some decks, certainly skin tone diversity. Um, it has a very neutral kind of feel, especially with some tricky cards like the Hierophant um, and a lot of the Swords cards. This is probably the deck that I thought the, the author, um, Nikki Ferrata, did the best uh, at when she got to the Swords because she didn't make them all pain and suffering. She understands um, the Swords in a way that I like to read them trying to find some more here um, and so yeah I just I really appreciate um, so much about this like the three of wands for example um, I was just talking about swords cards but the figures in the boat right not looking from shore so it's not like the two of wands sometimes people have a hard time differentiating those and it can be tricky so the three of swords you know there's tears but there's the whole universe in your hands this is probably my favorite Four of Swords card of any deck ever. It's a wind chime. And that just sums up the Four of Swords to me. Um, so there's a lot that I really like about this deck. I like all the interesting hair. I like the cool textures on their clothing. Um, for the most part, I mean, Temperance has wings, but for the most part, this has been um, largely de-Christianized. And that helps me with my readings. I, I do not identify as Christian. And so sometimes the very heavy Christian imagery, like the original RWS, um, a lot of those cards uh, just are stump can be a stumbling block for me when I'm doing readings. And um, so for all those reasons, I originally picked this. Um, and I like a lot of these, these cards. You know, here we've got the Knight of Pentacles, and they have this long and winding road to go, but they do see the goal at the top. So there's like some really great imagery here. And when you put the cards out, you can um, work with the reading in a really um, dynamic way, I feel. I feel I get good readings from this. I think it's accessible. Um, for people to understand what's going on, like this Eight of Swords card. Um, she's blindfolded, but she's not bound. And to me, the Eight of Swords is more about concentration than it is about being stuck. So there's a lot that I love about this deck. What I don't love about this deck is that it has the heaviest rose petal finish, and it is very unpleasant to shuffle. Uh, my copy is also starting to develop a bow in it, so that makes it even more awkward to shuffle. I don't know if you can see that very well on camera, but yeah, it's starting to bow. And I do flip it over and shuffle it the other way, but it's it's unpleasant and I don't reach for it um, as much as I would like to. So I think I am gonna be getting rid of 
at least this larger copy, I do have the pocket edition, which has better cardstock on it. So that one is TBD. All right, the next deck that I got as a actually a request um, that I made because it featured <laughs> some of my hobbies was the yarn tarot. And I did do a detailed walkthrough of this one on my channel as well. Um, it's basically an RWS clone. I wasn't sure that if I would really want to keep it, but um, I figured it would be fun to just, you know, at least have a walkthrough and get to look at the cards. And so it is quite pippish. Um, a lot of the cards, again, in the RWS, like the Four of Wands, that would have people in them do not. Like, here's our Five of Wands. Um, I think in this case it's fine because it kind of conveys the energy or the sentiment of the card. But what I don't like about this deck is actually the Major Arcana. I feel like they didn't do a very good job of being imaginative. Um, with the Major Arcana, they could have done so much more. And um, it's a weird mashup of like this medieval RWS imagery with modern imagery, like this chariot card. So when you lay multiple um, cards out in a spread, they don't really go together. It's sort of like, what are we doing? Are we being modern? Are we being a clone? Um, what time period are we? I don't know. I'm confused. And um, some of the imagery is pretty sparse. So again, that just makes it a little bit repetitive, a little bit hard to grasp at times if my, um, if I'm not feeling like very intuitive that day or very inspired to be a great storyteller, this deck can be tricky to work with um, because of the sparse imagery. However, I do love the color palette. Again, earthy tones. And the other thing I love about this is the outfits, the textiles, the fashion sense. Um, yeah, everybody has got on amazing knitted items and they're just they're just so cool. Look at the pom-pom on his hat. Um, yeah, everybody's everybody's doing an awesome job with their outfits. So that was kind of an impetus to hang on to this for a bit, but I've decided that there's something better out there and we're leading up to it very slowly. So let's move on to our next deck. Now, as we're talking about modern decks, that's something else that I was looking for. And I did look at um, some RWS clones like the Saucer Ibito and the This Might Hurt Tarot and some other kind of cute cartoony sort of decks. Um, and the one that I landed on is this one. It's called the Good Karma Tarot. Um, this one I liked because, or more than the others, because some of the imagery was different. It diverged from the RWS, so it wasn't a straight up clone. Uh, I like some of the choices that the author made in the way that she depicted the cards. I loved the colors. And I really love the textiles again in this deck. So can you see she has a light bulb, a light bulb print all over her shirt? That's the Page of Swords. The Queen of Cups has seashells on her bathing suit. Um, so it's like everybody is dressed really cool in this deck. There's um, a fair amount of diversity. There's not a lot of age diversity in this deck, but um, otherwise there seems to be. And you've got lots of tattoos and lots of cool hair going on. Um, yeah, there's a lot to love about this deck. I do like that some of the court cards are active. So here we've got the Knight of Coins and he's in his uh, workshop. It looks like he's working on a carpentry project. So that's really cool. But um, some of the choices here are a little strange, like our tower. Why would have you made that a medieval castle tower when everything else in this deck is so modern? Um, I, I don't understand. It's like we're going to update it, except we're not going to update it. And so that's tricky. The other thing, I mentioned the tattoos, there's a good card. Um, the other thing that this deck does that um, is a little strange is that some of the characters seem to repeat, right? So we have the high priestess with pink hair and she's also the moon. I mean, it's not exactly the same person, but it, it looks awfully similar. And I have seen that throughout. Sometimes that can work well um, if you've got someone who's in a story and you want to follow them through a few cards, but it doesn't always work really well. Sometimes it just feels repetitive. 
So that's a little tricky for me. The other thing is that some of the choices just seem a little bit um, off in terms of exactly what images they chose. Like this one has more of a Seven of Cups feel to it. That's the Nine of Cups. And the Seven of Swords is a little bit too specific for me. Um, this one's weird. The Six of Swords depicts somebody climbing a hill, which is more of an Eight of Cups kind of thing, and there's no water in the Six of Swords. So it feels at times that we're doing RWS and feels at times that we're not, and I don't quite get the logic behind this. I haven't completely decided to get rid of this deck. There's a number of cards where I just really like the image. Um, so I'm kind of on the fence still with this one. I like, I love this page of coins. He's coming out of... Um, you know, it looks like he's a freshman uh, just going to his first class in university. Um, but then there's other ones where I'm like, eh, I don't know, like Judgment. You could have done, you couldn't have done something more interesting with that card. Um, yeah, it's, it's tricky. The Five of Wands, they don't look like they're working at cross pur purposes. This has more of a Five of Swords kind of feeling to it. So I'm back and forth on a lot of the choices in here. I do like our King of Coins. He reminds me of Flav of Flav. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of torn on this deck. Um, but I haven't been reading it with it very much because, again, people either don't choose it, um, I do read for a lot of older folks, or um, the glossy card stock is just something that I don't reach for for myself. So this one's in the maybe pile, but it's in the probably maybe going away. And then the last deck that I'm going to consider replacing, again, all of these decks replaced with one, uh, one choice, is this is the Tarot for All Ages. Um, and this was another one I kind of couldn't decide between this one and the Good Karma Tarot. So I got them both because they're both very ex inexpensive and I wanted to handle them and check out the cardstock for myself. Um, this one again has beautiful colors. It's got interesting imagery that diverges from the RWS. It does rename the court cards again and a lot of the majors. So here we have stewards, uh, guardians, and I can't remember what else um, for the four court cards. And it's got some really cute imagery and some kind of funny, um, almost surrealist imagery. But I don't like um, that, for example, all the stewards are in the same kind of configuration. So, you know, all the queens look similar, all the kings look similar, it's just maybe their skin tone and their outfit is slightly different. Um, a lot of the faces are very close up, and I, I prefer to see people in context, like in a scene with other people, or at the very least in their environment. Um, they've also taken a lot of people out of these cards. I love this Dreamer card, though. This is the High Priestess. Um, probably one of my favorite High Priestess cards. If I was putting a deck together from all my different tarot decks, this would be my High Priestess card for sure. So it's hard, you know, to get rid of decks when you really love a particular card. But a lot of these are just really oversimplified in a way. And again, I have trouble getting a good reading from them because of that. Like, what do you do with the Six of Wands? I mean, I get it. I see the symbols. I know what the dictionary definition of that is. But because I'm not seeing any people interacting, it's really difficult for me. Um, and then, like I said, a lot of the faces are very close up. So again, it's it's hard to, to really get a sense of the person when you can't see them in their whole element. Like there's our sages. And all of our sages, again, are like a half profile staring at an item. So same thing with the guardians. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't been able to connect with this deck. I'm probably going to get rid of it. Um, even though I really love the colors and I can appreciate the fact that they used um, a lot of different skin tones and a lot of creativity, you know, it, it took a lot of creativity to come up with all of these different designs and um, I think everything's really well executed, I guess, in terms of the compositions. Uh, making sense. I just, I'm not sure that the compositions tie in with how I read tarot or how I um, think of the cards. Um, even from a numero numerological perspective, it's a little 
again, not enough RWS to be an RWS, and but not enough something else to be its own thing that has a system and makes sense to me. And so here we have it, the eight decks that I'm going to replace with one. Um, for whatever reason, these weren't working for me, even though they have beautiful color palettes, a lot of them have alternative imagery, many of them are quite diverse, a lot of them have neutral images that I like to work with, there's great textiles and outfits, um, and like I said, there's beautiful colors, both bold colors and also soft uh, sort of watercolors as well. Um, there's something to like about each one of these decks, but a lot of them were sort of one note for me, and I kept feeling dissatisfied every time I would bring one of these out for different reasons. Um, and so my hope is that I can replace them all with one deck, and it's the Mara Loon Tarot. Um, this deck uh, came to my awareness last year, and at first I sort of wrote it off. I thought, oh, cute, another, you know, pastel Rider Waite clone, nice. Um, I had seen it on Robin uh, Toes Tool Tarot's channel at first, and then I saw Sarah of Sunset Bow do a walkthrough, and I think between watching those a couple of times, I'll link them below, I started to really get it with this deck um, and start to understand how it could fill all the, all the things I liked about the other decks that I mentioned. Um, the art style is sort of simple in a way, but we see more faces, we see more people than we do in some of those very minimalist decks. Um, I love the uh, age diversity as well as the um, ethnicity diversity here. We still get some interesting uh, hair colors on some of the cards, but it's not over the top. Um, we certainly seem to get different cultures, uh, so it's not just physical features in, in the diversity range in this deck, but there seem to be references to different cultures around the world as well. Without being cooperative or um, uh, appropriative in any way. It's simply, it, I think this, this deck really does do a good job of being representative because it's not represent, it's not trying to be specific um, to a specific, you know, maybe ceremony or ritual from a specific culture, but it just gives you a hint that maybe, oh, you're in, in you know, in this part of the world or that part of the world based on, um, you know, the clothing or the setting or something like that. So I think, I think that's an interesting take on it. Um, one thing I didn't mention about some of the other decks I showed is that it's hard to represent um, people with darker skin really clearly um, in artwork. And I find that tarot artists, for some reason, tend to struggle with this in particular. So for example, in the Starseeker Tarot, which is a collage-based deck, and it sort of looks like paper piecing, um, it's hard to see people's features. Even in the Melanated Classic, um, some of the darker skinned people there, you know, it's hard to distinguish, okay, where's their cheekbone, where's their chin, um, where's their forehead, you know, whereas this deck, um, the artist did a very good job of depicting people um, with a variety of different skin tones and making sure that we could still read their faces. Um, so I like that about it. Um, I love the soft color palette. It's sort of rich and soft and neutral um, all at once, which is is kind of strange to pull off. But we have, you know, these neutral tones like the skies here. We have some rich colors in the clothing. And um, yeah, I think they do they do a really good job of making the scenery beautiful without being overpowering. Um, and just pulling in a lot of different colors, but making it look cohesive. Um, I do like the alternative imagery in a lot of the cards, so I'll show you a few of my favorites. So here we have the Six of Pentacles, um, and you just see hands. You see giving and taking, but you don't know who's giving and who's taking. Like, is this person offering the bowl of coins and that person's taken one? Or is this person asking for alms and that person's giving a coin? Right, so you can you can play around with it depending on the context. Here we have the Five of Pentacles, and it's hard to see because the figure is very small, 
but they don't look completely destitute. They don't have any shoes on and they're wearing sort of plain clothing, but they don't look totally um, miserable either. So maybe they're being ascetic. Maybe they've, you know, given up their shoes in order to, you know, go through some physical trial and this is on purpose. Um, it's just, it's something that you can play around with again in readings. Um, here's the Ten of Swords. A lot of people struggle with this one typically because there's, you know, someone who's been run through with a bunch of swords, but there's no, there's no person in this one. It's just Ten Swords and then we get Ten Birds as well, which I equate with the suit of swords being air um, and birds flying through the air. One that I often struggle with is the Eight of Swords because um, the figure in the middle tends to be bound too tightly for my taste. I think of this again as concentration, not of being stuck. So the fact that these bindings are loose, that she could get out, and that she's um, got a clear path either to walk towards us or to go back through the swords, you know, I like that kind of imagery. Um, again, the Four of Swords, this is more about calm and meditation, um, kind of like the wind chime we saw in the um, Star Seeker Tarot. And the Three of Swords does not pick. Uh, depict a stamped heart. It's three swords and it still looks a little bit, you know, misty or um, maybe a little bit of turmoil or something like that, but there's a lot of different ways that you could work with that card that are not just quote unquote the heartbreak card. Um, the Hierophant, I love. Uh, I see key imagery used on the Hierophant card in several modern decks and this is one of them. And I love that. Um, for me, the Judgment card really works because it's not an, a winged angel. It's a butterfly fairy person. Um, and it just gives a little bit of, of a twist to that. And I also like the chariot. I haven't talked about it, but I don't love the war chariot as um, a modern symbol. It doesn't fit with a lot of other modern decks to have horses pulling a cart. So I like this one. It's a, a woman on a bird that she's flying through the air. And then even the death card is, you know, more of an open uh, interpretation there. It looks like a portal, um, as Sarah from Sunset Val pointed out in her video. So, you know, there's so much to love about this deck. It is simple, but it's not overly simplified. I don't think I'm going to get bored with this imagery anytime soon. There's enough texture. There's enough bright color. Um, there's enough going on in the facial expressions of the people that I feel like this is going to give me something time after time with reading. I feel like it's an approachable deck. It's, um, it's kind of cute in some ways, like cards like this. Um, or, and it's certainly beautiful. And so for a modern audience, a younger audience, I think this could give really nice readings and not be intimidating. At the same time, like I said, it does represent older people with the gray hair. So it's not going to alienate the, um, my audience that I typically read for. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's lovely. It's really lovely in a lot of ways. And the cardstock is absolutely wonderful. It is Make Playing Cards cardstock. Uh, I think it's Superior Smooth. I can't remember exactly which one it is, but you know, it's standard kind of modern playing card or tarot card um, cardstock. And that makes it very much uh, a pleasure to shuffle. It also makes it very easy to look at because it doesn't throw back a lot of light into my camera. So when I'm doing readings on video, which is how I do my readings, um, I don't have to worry about glare and flashback, and uh, it's very easy to shuffle, very easy to handle, lay out the cards and everything like that. Um, I will I will say that I hadn't ordered in, from Make Playing Cards before in terms of ordering a deck. I've ordered other stuff from them, uh, and these cards had a weird chemical odor when I first opened the box, so I did have to spread them out and let them air out for a few days, but that's largely uh, dissipated. So. Yeah, really beautiful. I will link to um, the Make Playing Cards store where you can buy this deck. Uh, it does not come in any kind of a box, but I paid an extra $2 and I got it in just a plain glossy tuck box. But you could also, you know, get a tin made from them or you could put it in a bag or any other kind of thing. Um, it doesn't come with a booklet, but it does come with some uh, cards with keywords on them. And so um, there is some assistance from the author if you if you want um, if you want that, or if you want to, you know, take, get her take on keywords and tarot meetings and things like that. But yeah, just a really beautiful deck. I think, um, this could serve a pretty wide ranging audience of potential, uh, 
querents or people that I'm reading tarot for. And I just love it. And just to go back to the textiles thing one more time, um, really beautiful outfits. Here are three cards that kind of embody this. So you've got um, just beautiful woven, or this even looks like a knitted cape, like a modern uh, knitting pattern that you know I would make. I, I could see making something like that for myself. Um, so I just love it for that reason. So yeah, there it is. And it's going to be my next go-to deck. Um, I think it, I'm looking forward to working with this. So let me know what you thought. Um, do you have any of the decks that I'm going to replace uh, with this one? Do you have this one? Um, have you had any kind of similar experience in your own collecting where you've realized that you know a particular deck could really take the place of a number of different things in your collection? Um, how do you curate your collection and decide what to buy? Let me know in the comments and I'll be back with more tarot in a future video. Thanks for watching.